We continue with our lecture on networking and the components that make up a network. Primarily, we are interested in how they relate to a typical K-12 environment. This could be the classroom, lab, or an ad hoc network setup. To review, network can be as simple as two computers connected to shared resources. These resources could be printers, scanners, and digital cameras, to name just a few. The connection itself could be wired or wireless, which means the data is transferred over the airwaves. Here we have a diagram of a simple classroom lab. We have client PCs along the bottom. They are normally connected by the wire connection, or CAT5. This is a type of LAN or local area network. Typically, a lab's PC would be connected together using a hub or switch. A school would have a central location for their connection to the outside world. Everything in the school would be considered part of the LAN, while connecting to services outside the school is considered a wide area network, or WAN. Typically, a connection to the outside would be handled through a router. We saw many of these hardware components in the other lecture. If any of these terms are confusing, you may want to revisit that talk again for further review. The cloud in the center represents the Internet and how all these services are connected. The idea of the cloud is to illustrate how these services can be connected in many various ways. Your request for an item on a Google Word search may not travel the same way twice. In the upper corners of the slide, we finish up with detailing what we are outside what are outside resources. These are found over the internet. These are what we call servers. We'll touch more on the term server and more in just a minute. Just understand for now that the www or website, file shares or FTP services are all provided through a server. We'll also see how that term can also mean the physical hardware as well. This slide will help illustrate a little better the difference in hardware. Starting on the left, we see a typical laptop. Working to the right, we see a desktop machine. This may sit on your desk or on the students may use it in the lab. Workstation is also hardware that you may find at your desk. Typically, it will be used for a specific and a resource intensive work such as an immediate production. Your library may have one or two special workstations for those big projects that need a little extra horsepower. And finally on the right, we have a typical server configuration. These are very beefy hardware in terms of their construction. This one also happens to be what they call blade server. Each sliver or blade is a standalone server or computer. You'll see that a server is very much just like your desktop computer, but to use a car analogy, it'd be like buying a Hummer for your grandmother to use to get to the grocery store and church on occasion. It'll get the job done for sure, but it'll be widely underutilized. Some of those features that are, we've discussed or beefed up are the memory, the disk space, and the processor. This is the brain capacity of the computer. The server is designed to handle thousands of requests at the same time. They're designed from the ground up to handle multiple requests for their resources. They, in effect, serve. So we've seen the hardware that makes up a server. Now you will see that the software they run, these specialized software applications, are also called servers. Starting with the operating system they run. In our classrooms, we're familiar with Windows, XP, and Apple OS X. These are OSs, true, but these companies also make stronger versions of their operating software to serve as a server's OS. Microsoft's first server OS was NT. Now it's called Windows Server 2008. Unix and the Linux distros that are based on Unix were made from the start to serve the role as a server OS. Usually these software OSs, when booted or started up, look very much like your client or desktop side counterparts. You have to dig deeper to see all the things they're designed to do. Some of the most recognized services that these servers provide would be web servers. Every time you go to your browser and enter your target destination, you are making a request of a web server. Other services you may use are file transfer or FTP. Many schools have network shares for keeping files, where you can get to them from anywhere in the school. Sometimes when you need access to them from home as well. By putting them on the network, you can have access from anywhere as long as the access is allowed. Finally, some other examples that would be a chat client you would use to communicate through a text-based interface, or IM, instant messaging. This is also dependent on a server to handle the connection between the clients or the users. Typically, this is a service provided from the outside the cloud, such as MSN or Yahoo, but a school could also run their own chat server that would be available only on their LAN. We talked about desktop PCs and backroom servers. Now, something in the middle is the thin client. 
They are very much like a desktop PC. You see them in the labs or walk-up stations or kiosks. Their difference and advantage is that they have an even smaller footprint. Normally, they're just a display, keyboard, and pointing device, no hard drive. They're centrally managed, which means they're connected to a server across the network. This way, almost all resources are shared and centrally managed and maintained. Even the application, such as your word processor, is located across the network and not on the thin client. This small footprint is a way to cut costs in not just hardware and software licensing, but in maintenance as well. This type of shared service is also what they refer to sometimes as cloud computing. Google Docs is a form of shared services over the internet. Virtualization of hardware and software is also a form of cloud computing. Let's summarize. A thin client makes up half of what we refer to as a client-server relationship. It means that the client is dependent on the server to get its job done. That much of the work is passed off to the server. A large server may be sharing memory or processor time, crunching grades for multiple teachers at one time. This server could also be sharing disk space for all of the school's students' projects. The term client is also one of those terms that's used in an additional way. Another use is just to say the word client. In the simplest sense of the word, it is an application that makes a request of a server. We've already kind of implied this. Your web browser, FTP interfaces, are types of clients. The web browser is asking for the web page, and the FTP client is asking either to grab a file from the network share or to give it a file. Your hardware, the desktop PC, is the client making the request as well. We've seen and discussed just the tip of the iceberg in terms of networks. As teachers, it's important to understand these terms and how they relate to your classroom. Understanding the simple differences between a client and a server and their connection over the network is something everyone should understand. To get an even deeper understanding, two really good resources online to try out are the computer section of the online Wikipedia and the computer section of How Stuff Works website. Both will help round out your understanding of networks, clients, and servers.